Good morning, everybody. How are you? It's nice to see you. Uh, to the governor, who I had a uh, meeting with this morning, the mayor, uh, who I've had a chance to visit with and talk with, to uh, all of the congressional and Senate leaders and the business leaders, community leaders, all of you that are here uh, at Mackinac, uh, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be able to spend a couple of minutes with you uh, sharing some thoughts about the things that New Orleans and Detroit and the current circumstances uh, have in common. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, after Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, I was on national TV and Chris Matthews uh, actually asked me the question, why would a cab driver in Detroit have any reason to help the people of the city of New Orleans? And I said at that time that an American tragedy requires an American response. That's the same reason why somebody in New Orleans should care about the people of Detroit and the people of Michigan. Only if we stay together as one nation, indivisible, are we going to do well. And so today I come here to discuss the importance of Detroit, uh, the importance of Michigan to the rest of uh, the country, and uh, to say to our brothers and sisters here uh, that we are with you. The short of it is, as Bob Marley said, you know what, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> Some people have been very quick to write off Detroit. After Hurricane Katrina, they said the same thing about New Orleans. They said that we were unimportant, we were backward. We were a dying city. Our time had come and our time had gone. They were wrong then and they're wrong now. Detroit was great once. And you know what? Detroit can be great again. Detroit can and will overcome its difficult circumstances, but if, and only if, we confront the problems head on. So there was a CEO. Her name was Martha. She was running a company. Things weren't going so well. She was upset. She didn't know what was wrong with it. She felt like she was going to stroke out. She went to the doctor. She said, look, I'm having a hard time, man. My company's struggling. I'm not sure if it's going to make it. I'm trying to do the best that I can. I go home at night. My husband's bothering me. My kids are pulling on me. The dogs bite me on the ankle. What should I do? And he said, well, Martha, I'll tell you what. It sounds like you're under a little stress. You need a little help. I want you to kind of calm down. What I'd like you to do is every day for the next 30 days, I want you to run 10 miles. Just do that. Exactly what I say and call me back. And Martha said, I'm happy to do it. And she did. And sure enough, 30 days later, she called the doctor. Doctor said, Martha, how you doing? She goes, oh my goodness, I feel so good. I'm calm, everything's good, life is wonderful, everything is just happy. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. How, how things back home and they're at work? She said, how the hell would I know? I'm 300 miles away from those people. <laughs> So, so, Mr. Mayor, you can't run away, right? You got to run towards the fire. You got to take on the toughest issues that you possibly can, and you have to find a way or make one in order for Detroit uh, to come back and to be able to thrive. It's an essential part of what you need to do in order uh, to have the city that you always dreamed of. And so my motivation as mayor of New Orleans is simple. The future of Detroit, New Orleans, and the rest of the country are inextricably linked. Detroit's struggles and how we as a nation respond to those challenges have far-reaching effects for all of us. Indeed, in Louisiana, in my state, the reverberations from Detroit's decline have been felt in a very personal way. When GM went into bankruptcy, it had to close one of its plants in Shreveport and 1,000 families lost their jobs and had difficult circumstances. There can be no better example that we are actually one nation. So here's the point, from the 504 to the 313, we are all connected. And by the way, Detroit didn't sink into bankruptcy overnight and by itself. In 1950, Detroit was the fifth largest city in the country, two million people abouts. Starting in the 60s, white residents moved out of Detroit. 
Factories started closing down, businesses started moving. By the 2000s, thousands of jobs had been lost. Then, if that wasn't enough, the Great Recession came, and now Detroit is half of the size it used to be, plus or minus some. And Detroit's experiences closely mirror what happened across the country. Near the same, nearly the same thing happened in the city of New Orleans. So now, like Detroit, every major American city must confront a similar slew of difficult, long-standing challenges, from fighting crime and creating jobs to improving schools, all the while budgets have to be balanced on a razor's edge. Huge bills are coming due for pensions and for infrastructure. Federal support is down. It's way down. In some instances, non-existent. COPS program in 1996 used to pay for police officers on the streets, 88% reduction in funding through today. And guess what? Unfunded federal mandates are up. They're way up. When somebody takes some money from you, right, and then they give you more responsibility, the gap gets wider, the harder, and your hill gets harder to climb. So what you going to do? I'm going to tell you what not to do. Y'all may know Boudreaux and Thibodeau from Louisiana. These are my partners. They usually go duck hunting. For some reason, they got bored. They decided they wanted to hunt moose. And they could only hunt moose kind of right around the corner from here up in Canada. So they found another friend that had a little plane. They flew him up here. Sure enough, I don't know how they did it, but they found a way to go out, and they bagged six moose. They started dragging the moose back to the plane, and their pilot friend said, hey, man, Woodrow and Thibodeau, you can't put six moose on this plane. It's not big enough to carry them. And they said, oh, yes, we can, my friend. We did it last year. We put them on the same plane, and we left. Well, sure enough, the pilot says, all right, maybe you know more than I know. They loaded the moose onto the plane. Plane tries to take off at full throttle, and wouldn't you know, the plane crashed. Woodrow and Thibodeau aligned each other in the crash, and Woodrow says to Thibodeau, hey, T, you know where we at? Thibodeau said, yeah, we in the same place last year where we were when we crashed. <laughs> And so, if you want to get ahead, you got to change. Change is hard. But as I said, change is going to come. The lessons from our experiences are clear. Government has got to be honest. It's got to be competent. It's got to be efficient. And it's got to be effective. You have to be fiscally responsible. When tough decisions to hold the line get put off, when sacrifice is not shared, when accountability for spending isn't demanded, everyone loses and everyone pays more in the end. All that being said, here's a larger point. It is true that Detroit New Orleans must change. As the Bible says, we should not put new wine in old wineskins. But struggling cities are not like children to be punished for bad behavior. Most people alive today weren't even around when the problems of the 50s and the 60s started. Plus, it's not like the average Detroiter was the one who put the city on the path towards bankruptcy. But some have suggested that the residents alone should be the ones to suffer. Now, I'll bet you right now there's a little boy standing on a corner in Detroit throwing a tennis ball up against a blighted building. He didn't have anything to do with creating that situation. And so the political theory of the notion that he should be made to suffer for the sins of those that went before him seems to me to be out of place. Where there's fault in Detroit's decline, it is most certainly shared by many parties. And so the suffering must be shared as well. The bottom line is that the broad solutions are needed where everyone takes responsibility from the city, state, and business community to financial institutions, pensioners, and the banks. And after all, we need to deal with big multi-generational structural challenges that are holding back cities in general as well. Sometimes it seems like no matter what the city does, they can't get ahead. And it's not because of lack of trying. For example, in New Orleans, Projected revenues, 9.6% growth this year, all right? 35,000 new residents moving into New Orleans as we speak. And this is really good. It's a good thing. But in New Orleans, our new costs for next year stripped by four. 
the amount of growth and revenue that we had. Spending's down $30 million, but we're still heading towards a budgetary cliff. The same thing's true in Chicago. Billions in new developments, a skyline that's exploded in the last decade. Mary Emanuel is looking down the barrel of a $19.5 billion pension bill that's coming due. In Philadelphia, Mayor Mike Nutter, a great mayor, same story, big time success, huge new investments, nearly a decade of population growth after years of decline, but still the Philadelphia public schools nearly did not open last fall because of a huge multi-million dollar budget shortfall. And of course, there is what has happened in Detroit over the last few decades. So you're challenged to balance your books. You've got to cut smart, meaning not stupid. <laughs> you have to reorganize every part of city government. And then you have to find a way, as hard as it is, to invest in the practical solutions that address the real issues that are affecting people's lives. Are the streets safe? Can your citizens find a job? Can you find housing for families, good schools for our kids, health care if they're sick? And is there a robust business climate that fuels growth? And at the same time, Detroit needs to find a way to build back not only the city itself, not just her streets, her schools, her homes, her businesses, and public spaces, but at the same time, can you build back the heart and soul of Detroit? There is only one Detroit. She is a special place. She's worth fighting for. She may have lost her way for a bit, but I come here today to tell you that you are not alone or forgotten. We want you back. So recreate Detroit as a better vision and version of herself rooted in the proud past, but moving forward to the future. This is not going to be easy. Here, and here's the thing. If you ask the people of Detroit, black or white, young or old, from downtown to the north end to either side of 8 Mile, you're going to discover a basic truth. We all, we all want the same thing. It's the American dream, a bright future for our kids, economic opportunity, safe neighborhoods, and we want our kids to do better than we did. And only if we stick together and stay and work together can we make it happen. We cannot move forward unless we all move forward together. That being said, Mr. Mayor, even on your best day, somebody's going to tell you that you should have done it better. Miguel Cabrera, maybe the best baseball player to hit the field in a long time. Batting average, 323. He had eight home runs. RBIs, 46. Last night, your wonderful Tigers won 5-4. to four. That's all right. It's a little home cooking. So how good is he, right? But sure enough, there's a knucklehead that sits on the first baseline, wants to tell Miguel how to play first base. No matter what he does, no matter how good he is, this knucklehead is in his ear. And so Miggy gets upset, right? Drags the guy out of the stand and says, look, man, if you think it's so easy, why don't you do it? So sure enough, this guy says, well, give me the glove, hot shot. I'll show you how it's done. First ball comes to him, it goes through his leg. Second one, it's a pop fly, he misses it. On the third, when the third baseman throws it to him, he must a catch and the guy gets on base. So Miggy comes over to him, takes the glove back, and he says, well, there you go, hot shot. It's not so easy at it. He says, Corbera, you got this job so screwed up, nobody can do it. <laughs> so here's the point. It's, it's easy to be a critic, all y'all out there, and to yell from the sidelines. But it takes a lot of guts and it takes a lot of leadership to take on the tough problems. And I think Mr. Mayor and Governor and Kevin and all of the folks that have been trying to put together uh, a solution out of this problem have been doing a great job. There are going to be lots of people yelling from the sidelines as you finalize the plan to help Detroit emerge from bankruptcy. Here's what I'll say. Keep going. Make the tough decisions from pension reform to oversight and how best to manage city services. One thing is for sure, it's going to take all of us, public, private, not-for-profits, the faith-based community, to figure out a way out of here. Now, a more than $800 million plan has been put on the table. I like the plan. I like the plan because it requires everybody to be in. It requires sacrifices from all. It requires partnership 
between the federal government, the state government, the local government, the not-for-profits. Everybody's got to be in. Everybody's got to share responsibility. Everybody gets to share opportunity. Everybody gets to share sacrifice. That is the way. This is a huge challenge that few have ever had to face. But as her story shows, do not bet against Detroit. Detroit, New Orleans, and cities in general remain the most indispensable parts of our economy and our culture. Cities are the creative engines that drive innovation and growth. Can you imagine an America without GM, without Chrysler, without Ford? Can you make it through the day without reaching back to grab a song from Diana Ross, Smokey Robinson, the Jackson 5, Marvin Gaye? Imagine the world with no what's going on. <laughs> Annually, 20 US metropolitan areas make up half of the total GDP for the entire American economy. And if you look around the country today to see where our economy is growing the fastest, where ambitious young people are moving, where tourists are going, it's the cities. Silicon Valley has moved into downtown San Francisco. Amazon just opened its new headquarters in downtown Seattle. Startups are flocking to New York City and Austin, Texas. And in the last several years, Quicken Loans, CEO Dan Gilbert has brought thousands of jobs to the heart of Detroit. This is big. One of the reasons cities died is because people and businesses moved out. Dan and other folks are leading the way. Smart investors should follow him. But there are limits to the progress that can be made by private industry alone. So much has to happen to make a city work. Like I said, I love Dan Gilbert for what he's doing. I understand that Roger Penske and the Illich family is doing the same. Dan has evidently brought new businesses and 12,000 jobs into the city, along with over $1.5 billion of investment in over 40 downtown buildings. Mike Walsh yesterday in the paper called it passion and money. That's a good combination. <laughs> but to make it all happen, Dan has to also work with local governments and the mayor. Somebody's got to police the streets. Somebody's got to fix the roads. Somebody's got to pick up trash. And at the end of the day, you can't get down to blight without working with government. Think about this. Even if Dan, the lion's owner, Bill Ford, Bill Gates, combined their net worth and plowed it into all of these same basic services, it would only take a few years for their money to run low. As a matter of fact, if you took the five richest people and took number four and five who were the Koch brothers, and took both of their 36 billions and put it together, they don't have enough money. Koch brothers kind of act like they want to buy America. <laughs> city by city or state by state or nation by nation, but here's the point, they don't have enough money, right? And plus America is not for sale, amen? <laughs> the point I want to make to you is that to be successful, business needs government to set the table. And that's expensive. But without a doubt, it's absolutely necessary. You want to know a strategy that works? Millions of Americans standing shoulder to shoulder. Everybody doing their part bit by bit. You want to create a tight, tidal wave of success? That's the American way that works. And it's not just local government doing the hard work. You have to work with not-for-profits and phil philanthropic organizations like the Kresge Foundation, which has been unbelievable, and there are many, many others that have said that they want to help Detroit stand back up. From there, it's national service organizations like City Year that bring the people to get the job done. And without faith-based organizations and neighborhood groups, it's not going to work. The community as a whole would be weak without all of the partners at the table. And when you're weak, you create more problems, more crime, more blight, more problems. And by the way, you can't leave anybody behind. All that being said, at the end of the day, it also revolves around strong families and each of us as individuals. None of it matters if there's no personal responsibility. To create a truly great city, we each have to take care of our business, whether that means helping our kids, finishing their homework, taking care of our property, picking up the litter on our street. We each individually have a role to play. To rebuild a city, everyone has to be involved, business, faith, neighborhood leaders, only when the whole city is united and everyone takes personal responsibility, not only their own lives, but their community, can the entire city make progress. And here's another reason for the nation to help Detroit. We owe you. At every moment in our history, Detroit and Michigan have been there, 
building and defending this great nation. Indeed, as it was the very start of the Civil War when Abraham Lincoln looked west to muster some 75,000 volunteers for the Union cause. It was Michigan who first responded, rushing the troops to Washington, D.C., with provisions and supply paid for by a $50,000 loan from the city of Detroit. After seeing the soldiers flood into the Capitol, the president remarked, quote, thank God for Michigan. And these troops served with great bravery and valor, at no point more notably than when the 24th Michigan Infantry out of Detroit stormed the fields of Gettysburg with the rest of the famous Iron Brigade. On that day, the Union hung in the balance, and the bravery of the 24th proved decisive, but at a great cost. 496 mostly Detroiters marched in, and only about 100 survived, an 80% casualty rate. From that moment, over 150 years ago, from small town to motor town to motor city, Detroit helped build the nation we are today by creating our first and strongest multiracial middle class. Now we need Detroit to help create the America for tomorrow. After all, who else is going to do it besides us? There is no greater engine for growth, no greater power for innovation, no smarter investment to make than in cities like New Orleans and Detroit. Now the struggle of years past is giving way to new opportunities. Just last week, Jamie Dimon announced that Morgan Chase was going to bring $100 million in new investments to Detroit. This is a sign of things to come. Detroit will come back strong. In New Orleans, we know a thing or two about coming back. Nine years ago, we almost lost it all when Hurricane Katrina crashed on our shores, causing billions of dollars of damage, 500,000 homes hurt, 250,000 destroyed, 1,800 people plus, brothers and sisters taken from us, and then many more of our nanans and our parans moving to other places. Suddenly, old divisions of race and class and creed did not matter. We were all in the same boat, literally trying to keep our head above water. For New Orleans, it was a near-death experience, but we survived and we persevered. Since then, while holding true to our unique culture, we sought to change our city and become a better version of ourselves. After all, necessity is the mother of invention, trust me. So in New Orleans, after Katrina, we ran to the fire. We took on the toughest issues. We made difficult decisions. We enacted dramatic but much needed reforms. We are remaking every part of our city, from schools to the healthcare system to the police department and city hall. We're running towards the fire, tackling tough problems like blight and violent crime. Yeah, we have a long way to go. We're not anywhere close to where we need to be, but we are making things happen and we are pressing on. Now we are one of the fastest growing cities of, in America, thousands of new jobs, our schools are improving rapidly, graduation rates are up, dropout rates are down, and blight is down and murder is at a historic 30-year low. It hadn't been easy, but nothing worthwhile ever is. But here's the thing, we're not rebuilding back to what we used to be, but instead we are trying to create the city that we always should have been. Use our experiences, good and bad, in New Orleans as a guide, and try to find comfort in this very sobering fact. We've actually been here before. In fact, even before the struggles of this era, 40 years ago, the great New York City teetered on the edge of bankruptcy. And 40 years ago, there was another young mayor from New Orleans, my dad, who had also been elected president of the United States Conference of Mayors. In 1974, gas cost 55 cents a gallon. Stevie Wonder was riding that Motown hit, Inner Visions. And my dad, along with your mayor, Coleman Young, led a delegation to Washington so they could advocate for federal emergency relief for the city of New York. It was very controversial back then, and nobody wanted to do it. But the mayor of Denver at the time, William McNichols, rightly said, every city in this nation is like the tenant in the same building. If somebody said the third floor is going to collapse, you can't say that it's not going to bother me because I'm on the second floor. <laughs> the same thing can be said today, Mr. Mayor. So with grit, determination, and help from the American people, New York City came back strong. 
By the 1980s, New York City was back again on her feet. The aid wasn't the only thing that brought New York back, but you know what? It was important because it symbolized a necessary truth. We are one nation, indivisible. That's not just an aspiration. It is an economic, it is a political fact. We are one nation. Now, it's almost hard to believe how close America's largest city and the fi financial capital of the world came to failure. And remember, there were some who said, let it go. The same dynamic is playing out again right now. Some think that the future of Detroit does not matter, but that is not true. I know Detroit will show us, too, that she can come back better than it was and build back for all of the people, not just a privileged few. It will be just as Father Gabriel Richard wrote when he penned Detroit's immortal motto following the fire of 1805. We hope for better things. It will rise from the ashes. Indeed, the spirit of Detroit is unbreakable as the iron forged in its furnaces and factories. Bankruptcy is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It's just a way station on the road towards a better future. Failure is not an option. We as a nation need Detroit at its best, and Detroit needs us. And I assure you, Detroit's best days are yet to come. God bless you all, and thank you very much. Please welcome the general manager of broadcast and programming and host of the Craig Folly Show at WDET, Craig Folly. <laughs> You're in the middle. Thank you. Y'all are nice. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, it's always uh, nice to have a guest who's probably more knowledgeable about the city than I am. Jeez. <laughs> the mayor told me all that this week. <laughs> no, I no. I want to tell Mayor Archer hello, too, who's been a great friend for a long time. Mayor, thank you so much. He, he, actually, he actually got me invited, so if you didn't like the speech, blame him. <laughs> No, the speech was the speech was great. I, I want to focus on a couple of the things that you were talking about there, and and I really think, given the recent experience that New Orleans has had in, in having an opportunity, frankly, to rebuild itself, this this sort of concept of a better version of ourselves, these are some of the most difficult decisions a mayor is going to have to make: determining where the resources are going to go, what type of investment is going to work in certain neighborhoods. Talk about sort of navigating the politics of those decisions about what neighborhoods are going to get what type of investment. Well, to thank, that's a great question, but it was loaded with a lot of stuff. So the first thing <laughs> is uh, don't build it back like it was before. Build a better version of yourself. One of the challenges with great cities like Detroit and New Orleans is that they have a history. You know, those are real people living in those houses, in those neighborhoods. Um, and as Mayor Duggan said this morning, he's completely right. That's not just a building. That's somebody's memory. It's... It's important. And of course, every city's got its own culture and its richness. And so when you get into the business of change, which is very, very hard for people, it doesn't come naturally for us, you could just kind of wipe something out and then bring something new and put it in. Or you can really kind of build back to its history. Now, in some instances, for example, I'll use New Orleans, somebody made some bad decisions along the way since 1960. The city of New Orleans in 1960 had 680,000 people in it. But the night before Katrina, we had 460. So our numbers were going down. And over that 25, 30 year period of time, um, the business community, the political community, other folks did something that caused people to leave. You've got to turn that around. But at the same time, you don't want to just throw away all of your culture, all of your history, all of uh, that which is important. And so it is important for the people of New Orleans to say, if we're going to do it, let's not build it back just like it was, which is your when you get into a cataclysmic problem, you just want to find security, and security was like it was yesterday, but it's not necessarily the way you always wanted it to be. So we took it as a, I want to use these words carefully, an opportunity tempered with responsibility to build it the way it should have always been from the beginning and not just completely and totally new. So that's a concept that I think is not easy to have permeate every neighborhood in the city. That's the first thing. Secondly. Um, everybody that lives in a neighborhood thinks their neighborhood's the most important, even if they're the only house on the block. Um, and I think that you have to work through that as a community. One thing that did not work in New Orleans well at all was that shortly after Katrina hit, the then mayor had a task force with business leaders on it. They brought in the Urban Lands Institute, a whole bunch of other people that weren't from there who were well-meaning. But they basically said, look, this is easy. We'll just shut down these 18 neighborhoods and tell those people they have to leave 
and move everybody else into other neighborhoods, except they forgot to ask the people whether they would actually do that. <laughs> and so that got to be a challenge, and I think you have to manage through that. Um, the mayor and the governor and uh, the receiver and all of the other community leaders are going to have to get together and talk about what the vision of the city is. You can't do everything for everybody, and you certainly can't do it all at one time, even if you had the most money in the world. And I just think that as a community, and this is why everybody has to be involved, you've got to have that discussion, and then eventually, you got to make a decision, and then you have to move. That sounds easy, but in politics, I call it the law of gravity or reality. You know, the actual doing it is much harder uh, than the talk. And I, and I think the expectations have to be set so that folks know that this is a, this is a long haul. Um, and it's going to take some time. So what, what criteria do you use when determining where to invest, which projects to undertake? As you suggested, the, the revenue is shrinking a little bit. You've got tougher decisions to make on that. Uh, it's, this is not advice, Mr. Mayor. This is just something that we confronted. When I came into office, um, the previous administration had committed about $1.5 billion in public investments, but we only had $900 million uh, at the time. And so there were two choices. One, you could spread the soup try to give everybody a little bit, hope they found the money to finish their projects, or you could run to the fire, make tough decisions, set priorities, and then fund 100% of the projects that you knew that you could do. Those were our two choices. In our, in our situation, I decided in consultation with our city council to say that I'm, I'm not gonna do everything for everybody because I can't. I'm only gonna do what I can, and I'm gonna take that 1.5 billion in request, and I'm gonna push it into $900 million worth of need and I'm going to put everything on a schedule and demand, as I reorganize my government, that we wouldn't announce a project that we couldn't finish, that we would be on time, on task, on budget, and nobody would miss their mark. And by doing that, we would build confidence to, to use further investment. And that has turned out to be a good call uh, on our part. Now, um, we didn't do it neighborhood by neighborhood. We did it project by project. Uh, because there's always a much greater need than the resources that you have. That will always be true for you. Money at the end of the day is not the only thing, but let me tell you something, it's better to have it than not to have it, <laughs> right? Efficiency, effectiveness, all of that thing is important, but if you don't have any juice, right, or enough gas in the car, it's not going to run. Uh, and so you've got to figure out a way to do that. I read the uh, reports of, of the blight strategy that, um, that came out, and I, I think I read, uh, I may have read it wrong, that uh, the damage is about $2 billion and you got about 450. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of distance between 2 billion and 450, and someone said, well, don't worry about it, we'll find the money. Well, that, that, that can only be the person who is not responsible for, <laughs> for, make, for making it happen. You gotta, when they tell you, don't worry about it, I'll bring the money, say, look, just you know, let me see it now. You know, so that, that helps as well. You know, you mentioned here that uh, current residents of a city like Detroit should not be punished for the, for the mistakes of, of previous generations here. But one of the problems that we've been facing in Detroit is that there is still a lot of bitterness about what's happened here. People who fled the city, again, see those memories that are no longer there. Well, they helped cause the problem. That, but getting them to recognize that I'm and just, suggest I don't, look, that I'm not from involved. here. But, but a lot of people who are complaining about how the city used to be, well, they're the ones that left. I mean, the city did, the city, I just, I, I hear, look, and we have the same problem. People that grew up in New Orleans moved to the surrounding parishes and counties, and they like to complain that the city's not doing well. Well, they used to live there, but they left, right? And so, and, and, and because they left, they didn't have responsibility for paying for taxes. They come in, they use the city. The resources in this, people from the city are bled. So I guess the bigger point is, is this, because I heard, I heard some folks that are against the grand bargain talk about, well, if we do this, we're going to be rewarding bad decisions. Well, that little boy on the corner today didn't make that bad decision, right? A lot of bad decisions were made, if we're being honest with each other, a lot of bad decisions were made by a lot of people, not just the rotten politicians, but business people that were thinking about something else, other folks that were thinking about it. You know, after the war, when the GI Bill hit, everybody moved out. When everybody moves out and jobs are not there and the tax base erodes, guess what? You don't have money to buy a police car fill up the gas tank, have a fire truck, um, do the kind of things that cities need to do, and then there's a downward spiral. Look, I love Dan Gilbert. I think that what Dan's doing is to be applauded. I wish we had 10 or 15 people, but if every business leader moved their businesses back down into the cities, like it used to be in 19 wherever, it would be like that. 
It's not like that now. I will tell you this, though. In my view, the world is changing dramatically right now. Um, generations to generations change. So in the 60s, uh, when the GI Bill hit and everybody was moving out, and all of the major uh, um, you know, impetuses was to go that way, it's now turned around. People are moving back into cities. And you're seeing cities that are becoming the center of the economy. And as that reverses, if you, if you hit it right and you create a virtuous cycle of success, which, by the way, seems really evident to me. I've only been here for a short period of time. I've talked to a lot of people. I've read as much as I can read. But when you have Jamie Dimon putting $100 million in your city and you have Dan Gilbert saying, I'm going to move my business back, people with money might want to think why those smart guys who really have done well in their lives are making those decisions. They think there's a return on their investment, right? And when other people follow, you'll create a virtuous, virtuous cycle of confidence. And then I would say this leadership really, really matters. And I think on this point, Mr. Mayor and the governor and Kevin are all coming to a grand bargain. When you have a Republican and a Democrat, when you have federal, state, and local folks coming together, you know what? Give them room and back them up because they're making tough decisions and they need your support. And I think that makes a difference as well. When it comes to sort of breaking down that attitude, though, that you said, uh, you know, that people may have saying that you're just rewarding bad decisions, I mean, how much does that attitude change when you see a, a return to, to quality governance uh, and, yeah. and restoring that faith in government? Because that's something that was really, really lost. Well, I would say this. I, I said in the speech, you, you don't put old wine in new wineskins. In other words, the reason I like the, the concept of the grand bargain is because it also demands structural changes. You wouldn't just go take you know, that new money and put it in an old system that you know doesn't work. For example, all over America, pension systems, they're, they're out of whack. They don't make any sense. But as part of this new arrangement, you know, you've got to change those structures. You've got to create a government that's more effective, more efficient, that's smaller, that's faster, that's more entrepreneurial. You have to take this as an opportunity to tell governing authorities, you got to change the way you do business. That doesn't mean that government doesn't have any role. It doesn't mean the private sector can do it itself. In America right now, because of this downward pressure from the federal government not being able to do too much, to state governments not wanting to raise taxes, all the pressure runs downhill. It's going to force new models. And the new model that works in New Orleans is when there's a federal, state, and local partner at the table, when there's a not-for-profit at the table, when private business is at the table, when the faith-based community is at the table and everybody's putting in that model is producing a good result in the city. That's different from back in the 70s that I alluded to earlier when the federal government maybe was just putting in monies and cities were spending it. Now, I think that money is really important, but it's not always the thing. And I think I call it the mousetrap of governing. When you reorganize that mousetrap of governing and you begin to design, which the mayor's doing right now and spectacularly well, a new attack on blight in partnership with the private sector and philanthropies, you will see a new way. Now, once you do that, it's not really arguable that you're just trying to reward a bad decision. What you're trying to do is reward new innovation and hard work, right? Sometimes people use as an excuse just to evade their responsibility, right? So, so how do you prove then uh, that the decisions that you're making are indeed different? That's a, great, that's a great question. You have to set up accountability measures and measure everything that you do. So for example, you will know through population whether or not you're doing well or not, because people vote with their feet. And so there's going to be a beautiful moment. I was sp speaking with the mayor earlier when the number of people moving out flattens out and it turns around and starts going back up. Y'all need to stop that day and have a party, <laughs> right? And to, and to recognize that you're doing well. On the blight piece, if you're counting, right, you'll see that the number's gone down. Uh, on the crime stats, if, if you get, and this is the hardest, because we all have major challenges with this, if violent crime starts to go down, murder starts to go down, you know, then all of a sudden you, you can see those numbers, but you have to be accountable for them, and you have to have objective measures that are data-driven that people can have confidence in over time. And, and I think that, that, again, it's a slow thing. I would say this, too. You need to manage your expectations fairly well. This is a very, very hard thing that the city of New Orleans is trying to do and the city of Detroit, and it just does not move at breakneck speed. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to reorganize the structures and then to get everybody moving in the same direction and then to achieve the result. And a lot of it has to do with how much manpower you have, how much resource you have, and whether everybody's pulling in the same direction. 
Again, it seems to me, just from an outsider's observation, that you all should be very proud. It sounds like everybody really is coming together nicely. Evidently, you don't have unanimity, but you know what? You don't need unanimity. You know what you need? You need 66. That's consensus. When you have consensus, you can do a lot of stuff. <laughs> Asked to be juxtaposed from 50% plus one. And if you try to build to consensus, which is, it looks like the political and the business leaders are trying to do, you can create a model that can sustain itself over time. And that's, in our sense, what we're trying to aim for in the city. Not an easy thing to, to attain, but I think a, a goal worth striving for. Well, Mayor Landry, just a couple of minutes left here. Uh, many people have suggested that cities like Detroit, uh, New Orleans, Pittsburgh, uh, older cities, should just accept the fact that they are going to be smaller cities. Be a smaller city that is well run and you'll be just fine. Do you, do you accept the notion that a city like Detroit should settle on a number of, say, planning for 750,000 people going forward, or should you never put a number attached to that? That's a good question. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that you can um, identify a city's value by the number of people that live there. I, I just, that, that, that doesn't, you, you have to figure out what size works for you over time. Clearly, the city of Detroit has the capacity to have at least two billion people, because you did it one time, right? Probably even on a smaller footprint. As a matter of fact, I noticed in the stats today, New Orleans actually is, is physically a little bit bigger than Detroit, and we have a th a half of the number of people. At one time, the city of New Orleans had 680,000 people. Now we've got 380. It depends on how you want to grow. I noticed that Mayor Bloomberg in New York, when he was trying to recreate Brooklyn and Harlem, this gets into zoning issues that are, that are really complicated. How high do you want to build up? How much space do people need? What's the culture of the community? Does everybody want to live in a house with a big yard, or do people want to live downtown in apartments? It, it, that is about managing growth, is what it is. And you can be as big or as small as your physicality will allow you to be and your transportation you know, infrastructure wants, wants you to be. And I think that that number ebbs and flows, but I don't think the value, I don't think cities that are bigger are absolutely better than cities that are smaller. Raleigh, North Carolina, for example, is a small town, but the quality of life is great. Chicago, New York are big towns, and for lots of people, the quality of life is great. You gotta find what works for you, and one size doesn't fit all. And by the way, in this notion of, of, uh, of, of governing, um, Governments are businesses, all right? The way you cut and the way you grow are essentially the same thing. You can grow stupid and you can cut stupid. You can. That's not a philosophical issue. Now, I know we get stuck on being Republicans, Democrats, and is government big or government small. Mayors don't have that luxury. You just have to have a government that works. And sometimes it's big and sometimes it's small. Sometimes it's private sector, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you bring things in-house, sometimes you contract. It depends on what works. And what works ought to be what you follow, not some ideological theory about whether it ought to be to the right or to the left or private sector and public sector. In my experience, what's working in New Orleans right now is a combination of all of them, rightly focused, right size, rightly invested, without a fear of, of breaking the China in how things are run. There are no sacred cows. There is nothing that can't be fixed. There's no problem that can't be solved. And if you approach it like that with an open mind, and you have good leadership. And by the way, if you give your leadership the freedom to lead, it's really important for the governor and for the mayor and the folks that are doing stuff, they need you to back them up when they make a hard decision. Let me identify a hard decision for you. When they're doing something to you that you don't like. <laughs> Do you feel me? Because what happens is, you, I mean, no. Uh, Russell Long said at the best, you know, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. <laughs> don't cut me, don't cut you, cut the man behind the tree. Everybody wants them to do something as long as it affects somebody else. The question is when it affects you and when it's hard. That's what sacrifice means. Let me tell you what it means. It means paying a little bit more. It means taking a little bit less. It means when you want roads fixed, kind of waiting in traffic. If you want your roads fixed and you yell at your man to fix your roads and he starts fixing them and then you call him and you yell at him, yell at him because you're in traffic, that dog does not hunt. <laughs> right? That's what sacrifice means. I mean, it's a real thing. And so if everybody's in and everybody's patient and everybody's responsible and everybody gets opportunity and everybody sacrifices, you will find a way based on what's important to you guys to get out of the trap. It's getting everybody together 
That's the hard part. And I just have to tell you again, I'm thrilled for you because it sounds to me like y'all got it going on, like you got your mojo back and y'all are feeling really good about being able to talk to each other and work towards uh, a common goal. And, and I think that you have everything you need and I have no doubt that you guys are going to come back. You're going to come back strong and you're going to be a great example for New Orleans and for the rest of the country. Mayor Mitch Landry, thank you. Thank you.